Herzlich willkommen zu diesem Donnerstagabend im Museum. Es ist ein Vortrag, der wieder in unserer Reihe erscheint, im Rahmen der Ausstellung Farbe in Schwarz-Weiß, Josef Löwes fotografische Drehscheibe. Wir haben heute eine Gastsprecherin aus Belgien eingeladen, Grit Bonn. Herzlich willkommen. Sie wird einen Vortrag halten über Picturing Rubens Oeuvre, The Photographic Impulse in the Late 19th Century. Um, die Vortragssprache ist Englisch, so let's switch to English now. Grit Bonn studied art history and curatorial studies at Ghent University, elaborating on her master dissertation on the illustrated art books of Edgar Degas. Grit obtained a grant of the Flemish Research Fund for a PhD at, at Ghent University entitled Rubens in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, the oeuvre of Peter Paul Rubens in illustrated art books, film and television. In her research, Grit Bonn examines the changing relationship between mechanical reproductions and the original artwork in the context of the Rubens Centennials in 1877 and 1977. She already published several articles about this subject such as Visualizing Rubens in Modern Art History, The Copy and the Real Thing, Changing Perception between the Rubens Centennials in 1877 and 1977, or um, Moved by Rubens, the Double Logic of Image Perception in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. In February this year, Rit Bonn organized a conference in the Rubinanum in Antwerp on Rubens in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. We, Sabine Pino and Hanna Schneck, um, had the honor to take part at this conference and hold a lecture about Josef Löwy and his photographic turntable, which he used for his photographic campaign of the Imperial Paintings Collection in Vienna from 1888 to 1891. The um, Imperial Rubens collection in Vienna was among the first to be photographed in the campaign according to the importance and due to the size of the panel paintings which had to be moved on time into the new building of the Kunsthistorisches Museum. The director of the Imperial collection, Eduard Ritter von Engert and Josef Löwy worked closely together on this photographic campaign, as we show in our exhibition entitled Farbe in Schwarz-Weiß, right now at the Kunsthistorisches Museum. It's still on display until the 1st of May. So it's a pleasure for us to welcome Grit Bonn at the Kunsthistorisches Museum now. Thank you very much for coming to Vienna in person and for giving us an exciting talk tonight about picturing Rubens' oeuvre, the photographic impulse in the late 19th century. The floor is yours, Grit. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction and the kind invitation, Sabine Pinot and Hannah Schneck. It's truly an honor to be here in the context of the exhibition Farbe in Schwarz-Weiß. And there seems to be no better place uh, to introduce my research on Rubens and mechanical reproduction than here in the Kunsthistorisches Museum with such an amazing collection of Rubens' compositions. The Siegenborn Antwerp-based and cosmopolitan Baroque painter Peter Paul Rubens created an impressive oeuvre in appearance as well as in quantity and geographical dispersion. His courtly and humanist education took him on semi-diplomatic missions to cities in Italy, Spain, France, England, and the United Provinces of the Netherlands. During these missions, Ruben's brush formed his most powerful weapon of negotiation, resulting in a vast oeuvre distributed over the secular and religious palaces of 17th century Europe. Following the examples of Titian and Raphael, Rubens was moreover one of the first Flemish masters to engage with graphic reproductions to spread his works to a broader audience. I am not a Rubens scholar, and my interest in the artist mainly stems from the rich material that his case brings to the study of art reproduction. Not only did he found his own reproduction workshop, working with the best engravers of his time to translate his oeuvre in black and white, his abundant presence in European art collections, such as the Habsburg Collection, 
of paintings also provided us with a lot of comparative material of reproduction photography and photomechanical prints that since the late 19th century widely circulated as a result of three colliding developments. The consolidation of nationalism, the professionalization of art history, and the transformation of photography into a competitive business model. Since the birth of photography, its use for art reproduction was recognized, and the difficulties to accurately reproduce, especially oil paintings, was an important catalyst for technological innovation. When re when re when researching photographical reproductions of paintings, Anthony Hamber therefore referred to a higher branch of the art. And if we look at Louis' negatives, recording Rubens' works in the Imperial Picture Gallery during his photo campaign in the late 1880s, we immediately grasp what this means. And I should thank Sabine Pinot and Hannah Schneck for providing me these digitized positives made after the original negative glass plates. For every picture, interior and exterior shots were compared. Lightning, color filters, and the orthochromatic emulsion itself had to be prepared according to the color hues in each painting. And I have two more examples of that. The Viennese art collections formed a lucrative source for local photographers specializing in art reproduction, such as Karl Haag, Hugo Otmar Mietke and Carla Josef Waura, Victor Angerer, and of course, Joseph Löwy. However, local companies soon got international competition from businesses combining photography and print technologies, such as Braun, Hamstangel, and Bruckmann. Through these companies, images of Rubens' works could be purchased in different formats and print techniques, advertised in sales catalogs, but they were also published in thematic issues um, and as part of illustrated monographs that developed around 1900. This is how Lévy's developed image of Rubens, Simon, and Euphigenia looked like. It shows how exceptionally detailed Lévy's images are. We can even see the texture of the painted surface, the linen support, and the glance of the varnish without it disturbing the painted composition, which is equally uh, recorded with the highest quality. Although a comparison with the original glass plate shows us how, areas, how some areas are obscured, and you can see that, um, if we compare it to a recent digital color reproduction, it is still remarkable how nuanced and sharp, especially the darker areas in Louis' uh, photographs are. This is presumably a carbon print, a high quality photographic technique that was preferred by art historians and specialist photographers because unlike albumin prints that were very sensitive to decoloration, carbon prints left the image unchanged. And this was needed because this image and 33 others uh, of Rubens' reproduction taken by Löwy in Vienna coll Viennese collections were displayed in the Museum of Fine Arts in Antwerp for almost 30 years since 1890, where they uh, hang among 1,368 other reproductions, photographs, and engravings of Rubens' oeuvre. But how did these images end up in Antwerp? To answer that question, I have to take you back to the Rubens year 1877 for what is a remarkable case study of the impact of this photographic impulse in the 1870s and 1880s on the emerging art history and Rubens scholarship in Belgium. A case study that, as I will argue, bears many similarities to Edward Ritte von Engert and Joseph Löwy's uh, photo campaign of the Habsburg collection of painting in Vienna, and therefore fits perfectly within the context of the exhibition. The 1877 celebrations on the occasion of Rubens' 300th anniversary included an art historical congress. Its ambitions invitation letter stated, quote, in this ardent melee which marks her time in transition, we should ask ourselves whether it is not appropriate to establish our ties of affiliation with the past and, while claiming the glorious heritage of our ancestors, to let it be extensively permeated by the powerful breed of modern ideas. Like the first International Art Historical Congress organized in Vienna four years earlier, 
This event also discussed the benefits and potential of the modern technology photography for art historical research. For example, by pho photographing archival documents and correspondence related to Rubens. Moreover, Gustave Rollin Jacquemin, chairman of the Society of Fine Arts in Ghent, proposed to establish a committee with the ambitious mission to photograph all of Rubens' paintings and make them publicly avail available in the Antwerp City Archives. Such a collection would not only appear, appeal to scholars and stimulate international art historical interest in the artist, but also make an impression on both local and foreign visitors and do justice to Antwerp patriotic feeling. To develop the pro project, the City Council appointed a provisional panel with the eminent Rubin scholar Max Roses as its secretary. It is uh, Roses' archive in Letterenhuis, the Rubinianum, and the Plantin Moretis Museum that provided most of the archival material in this lecture. In 1879, the final report of this provisional panel listed a total of 2,719 works by the artist, including paintings, sketches, and drawings. Of the paintings and sketches, more than 800 had never been copied. Nearly 700 were only known true copies, and almost 300 were deemed to be lost. And the city owned fewer than 500 engraved or photographed copies of these works, it seemed impossible to photographically record all the remaining artworks as was initially intended. Max Rose stated, quote, it is clear that we will not succeed in producing those pieces. One only has to check the case here in Antwerp of the 10 pieces that still need to be copied to convince oneself. One half, the one in the churches, will probably not be done because the paintings are hung too high, while the other half will only be done if the owners are willing to lend a hand." End quote. To create as complete a picture of Rubens works as possible, therefore the panel decided to rely on reproductions already existing, and I quote, no matter how insignificant, and to purchase more than thousand already existing engravings and etchings so that only 653 new photographs had to be commissioned. With an estimated average cost of 10 francs per print and 60 francs per photograph, and with only half of the photograph expected to be obtained, a committee to collect Rubens' oeuvre in engraved and photographic reproduction was established in 1880 with a total budget of 30,000 francs equally divided between the city and the state to be spent over a period of 10 years. By 1890, the Rubens Committee collection consisted of more than 1,500 reproductions, along with almost 300 illustrated books and albums on the artist. With nearly 600 photographs, of which 233 were taken at the committee's expense, the proportion of photographic reproductions was much larger than anticipated. The committee continued its activities with a smaller budget until it declared the collection complete in 1910. The current photographic collection is archived in the Antwerp Royal Museum of Fine Arts and consists of 918 photographs. Some of these were collected at the time but never exhibited. Other might have been added after the committee was officially dissolved. The project's objective reflected a change in the perception of art that was driven by its increasing reproduction. Popular events such as the Rubens celebrations in Antwerp provided the political as well as economic context in which the mechanical reproduction of art became a lucrative enterprise that further stimulated the technological innovations of photographic and photomechanical techniques in the 1870s and 1880s. The increasing professionalization and commercialization of both reproduction photography and art history in turn generated a new and unprecedented velocity of image circulation to which the Rubens Committee actively contributed. Art was becoming more than ever defined by the interaction between original images and their reproduction. As I have discussed in an earlier work, the public engagement with art in this paradigm can be described as a double logic of image perception. Through their remediation, reproductions initiate a centrifugal movement that spreads the work's image to a broader audience, simultaneously causing a centripetal force that enables us to see and approach these images as part of a comprehensive oeuvre. 
This model suggests that reproduction, uh, reproducibility and circulation are preconditions for the art historical conceptualization of oeuvre. And as you can see, this does not necessarily have to be uh, photographic. If we look at the earliest uh, definition of the word in Antoine Furtier's Dictionnaire Universel, the term oeuvre had uh, originally been used only in the female form, signifying work, as in masterpiece or chef d'oeuvre. But by the 1690s, and I quote, with regard to painters and engravings, we call the oeuvre of a master the collection of all the engraved pieces we can find, end quote. This direct reference to painters, however, disappeared in subsequent dictionaries because unlike prints that could be seen together as they were commonly assembled into albums representing the engraver's life's work, the painter's production could not yet be imagined in its entirety at the end of the 17th century. The 1694 Dictionnaire de l'Académie Française connected the word to prints where oeuvre could be used to indicate the collection of all the prints of the same engraver. The origin of the contemporary use of oeuvre in the art historical discourse is hence directly related to visual reproduction, whose inherent features are multiplicity, circulation, and the relative ease of assembly, collection, and display associated with paper objects. The first mention of the Rubens oeuvre dates back to 1767, when Pierre-François Bazin devoted the third volume of his Dictionnaire des Graveurs Anciens et Modernes to l'oeuvre de Rubens. A catalogue of all reproduction prints after the master preceded by Rubens' biography. Although the volume still enumerates more than 1,300 engravings and not paintings, oil sketches, and drawings, their description and iconographical classification is now subordinate to the life and work of Rubens and no longer to the engravers that are listed in the first two volumes of Bazin Dictionnaire. Still, Rubens' oeuvre remained a purely rhetorical figure based on an imaginary collection of dispersed images. Print collections assembling Rubens' work in graphic reproduction did exist at that time, but these were private initiatives in which an oeuvre emerged without the discursive consequences of its public disclosure. The development of the catalogue raisonné and the monograph in the 19th century offered the essential non-static spaces for the central position of the oeuvre in thinking about artistic production. But as Gabriel Quercio remarked in his genealogy of artist monographs, quote, to look at the whole of an artist's work is to turn sight into insight, demonstrating the connectedness of a structure or plan of organization that simultaneously accounts for and melts down their out outward forms and inner forces, end quote. Only in the second half of the 19th century was this understanding of an oeuvre possible, um, as this was predicated on the existence of mechanical reproduction. Roland Jacquemin, the initiator of the Rubens project, described it as follows, quote, reproductions that would allow the work to be seen and compared, for let us not forget what is needed is the history of the artistic thought of the master, end quote. Mechanical reproductions thus generated a shift in the scholarly attention from the isolated narrative of the image to the narrative relation between the images. For the Rubens uh, Committee, the collection of reproductions was not just a heuristic tool to write such history of Rubens' inventions. Since its conception, it had been the committee's aim to publicly exhibit the collection in the Antwerp Museum of Fine Arts. Photographic exhibitions, including reproduction photography, flourished from the 1850s onwards, thanks to international exhibitions that used photographs as part of a nationalist and imperialist strategy in the guise of a democratization of art. Similar patriotic intentions lay at the foundation of the Rubens Project. However, an exhibition of such scale dedicated solely to reproductions of art and combining both engraving and photography to create a comprehensive survey of the work of only one artist was unprecedented. The history of the collection display is therefore emblematic for a new and systematic view on art and as a groundbreaking scholarly achievement in effectively exposing the notion of oeuvre as a purely visual discourse. 
The display of the committee's collection had been directly inspired by a proposal for a photographic exhibition in preparation for the 8077 Rubens year, written by the Belgian photographer, publisher, and entrepreneur Joseph Maas, who had opened a studio in Antwerp in 1870, specializing in photomechanical reproduction techniques, such as photoautotype, and he was also a pioneer in the development of the Belgian illustrated art book. In his letter to the organizing committee of the Rubens celebrations, Maas proposed, quote, to bring together in a major work a vast encyclopedia, the photo autotype reproductions of the master's work, scattered throughout the museums and galleries of Europe, and thus to erect, in memory of the immortal artist, a truly imperishable monument to then present the series of plates in the master's house to be acquired by the city so that it can be exhibited in his own home, the reproductions of the masterpieces which his genius had dreamed of and given birth to. Rubens oeuvre consists of a considerable number of paintings and drawings. We believe, however, that it would only be appropriate to reproduce the, the most outstanding ones, whose authenticity leaves no doubt, and to set the number of plates to be reproduced at 1,000. We would thus have the most splendid, the most considerable collection that has appeared so far, in all respects worthy of the illustrious man whom it is a question of glorifying. We are convinced that all those who love art would applaud it. And so he goes on. The parallel to the ambitions of the Rubens Committee is apparent, even though Mass stressed that, quote, in order to obtain a homogeneous series, the work can only be carried out by one photographer skilled in this kind of work, end quote, which is not only a clear application for the job, but also indicates the aesthetic objectives of his proposal, which was essentially conceived as an aesthetically coherent installation of skillfully executed photographs. As I have argued, such a focus on the medium-specific features of the copies was absent in the art historical oeuvre project of the Rubens Committee, partly due to the practical and financial considerations. According to Maas, his project could be realized in no less than four years. He also proposed to split the cost for the project between the city and the state, the latter also being responsible for the necessary authorization requests. The cost estimated by Maas, however, amounted to more than three times the budget obtained by the committee in a period of 10 years. It is therefore not surprising that the city council rejected the project and replaced it by a more feasible exhibition, L'œuvre de Peter Paul Rubens, Gravure, Photographie, Dessin, Document, etc., where next to engraved copies, 245 photographic reproductions provided by several international museums were assembled. The photographic prints shown in this exhibition formed the basis for the com uh, committee's collection. However, only a fraction of the pictures seemed to have made it uh, to the final display in 1890. Only 17 photographs after Rubens' paintings and oil sketches attributed to the same photographer feature in both exhibition catalogues. The encyclopedic aspirations of Maas and Roland Jacquemin correspond to the modern zeitgeist, a desire to visualize progress, which found its ultimate expression in the Exposition Universelle. It's not surprising then, then when Antwerp hosted the 8085 World's Fair, plans were made to dedicate a section of the Fine Arts Pavilion to the display of the growing Rubens Reproductions collection, which at the time already amounted to nearly 1,300 images. To exhibit them, the organizers needed a gallery of 8 by 100 meters with four rows of display cases, each consisting of a horizontal and an upright part, as is shown in the plans by city engineer Gustav Royas. One can only imagine the impact that such an endless sequence of monochrome images together in one horizon would have. This architectural arrangement aimed at providing a pa panoramic view of the artist's oeuvre. As a mise en abîme, the display would have embodied the ambitions of the Antwerp World's Fair to promote the city that had put itself back on the map as an international seaport after 200 years of decline. With an exhibition of Rubens' oeuvre, the self-proclaimed metropolis of art and um, the metropolis of trade and art could reassert the status of artistic epicenter that it had acquired in the 17th century. 
However, due to a lack of space and financial means to expand the pavilion, the initial Adi had to be modified several times and was eventually rejected. And so it was only in 1890, 10 years after the committee had, was founded, that the collection was finally exhibited on the occasion of the opening of the new Antwerp Royal Museum of Fine Arts, built to house the city's growing art collection in a new district that had developed south of the city since 1875. The museum institution had always encouraged the dissemination of its collection via reproductions. In its luxurious 1861 double folio catalogue, Le Musée d'Anvers, it proudly claimed to be, quote, the first in Europe to publish a museum in photographic prints. The catalogue was illustrated with 40 large album and prints, including nine after Rubens works of up to 28 by 38 and a half centimeters all recorded by Edmond Fierland, another pioneer in Belgian photography, known for his public commissions recording Belgian cultural heritage. In the preface of the unillustrated reprint and gallery guide of this catalogue, Wilhelm Berger, pseudonym for Theodore Thury, once again express, expressed the central concern on, what is, what, on which the later establishment of the Rubens Committee was based. Quote, Anybody in any country at the same time can have the entire work of a poet, a philosopher, a historian, a playwright, a novelist, or any other writer. Everything a man has written is collected in one or more volumes, reproduced ad infinitum, distributed everywhere, and everyone can possess the entire work exactly the same. But the work of an artist, painter, or sculptor, the series of his original productions, here and there scattered, is elusive. Each piece unique does not multiply. It's somewhere where you have to go and see it, then go and see another one at a distant time and place. Every amateur, every artist, every critic has dreamed of the gathering in some international exhibition of the works of their beloved masters. Today, Berger goes on to critique the reproductive capacities of engravings, which to him remained unsuitable for the translation of the general effect and tonality of paintings, presenting the craftsmanship of the engraver rather than the virtuosity of the artist. His appraisal of Fiedlands as the most renowned European photographer for the reproduction of old master paintings is tempered by the recognition of the new medium's limitations. Quote, to have a faithful image of a painting, it would be necessary to entrust its reproduction to a mirror. That is photography, except that it does not yet fix the local color, but only the monochrome range of tones and the right har harmony of the whole, end quote. Less than 30 years later, after this uh, museum catalog, reproductions of Rubens' oeuvre had thus re-entered the institution to form the solid foundation for the new, new mediums building. New museums building. <laughs> Here, reproductions were quite literally the new basis for art perception, as the committee's collection occupied much of the ground floor galleries and thus served as a physical and conceptual entry to the real artworks upstairs. The reproductions were thematically arranged according to Rose's catalog. Of each of Rubens' works, only one reproduction was shown, although the assembled collection had multiple engravings or photographs of most of the artworks. In some cases, a photograph was hung alongside a print, either because there is a difference between the old engraving and the photograph after the painting, or because both are remarkable from a different point of view. An example of this is Rubens' Lamentation from the Liechtenstein collections in Vienna, were produced by a contemporary etching and engraving by Peter Soltmann and a photograph taken in the late 1880s by Joseph Levy. If we compare both reproductions to a recent digital uh, reproduction, we immediately see that overexposure created too much contrast in the picture, resulting in a loss of detail in both the dark and light areas. The print by Soltmann, if we make abstraction of the mirror image, gives a more accurate uh, account of the musculature of Christ's dead body. However, his representation of the figure's heads are far removed from the original and the detail in the darker areas and the background are not worked out. 
Another example is Rubens' Annunciation from the collection of the Imperial Gallery. An immediate apparent difference is the lightning. Volswerts gives Mary a glowing halo, and the flame in the center of the image catches more attention than in the painting or the photograph. The background of the engraving, too, is a free interpretation of the painted scene. The clouds are highly pronounced, the angels deviate from their example, and the floor is tiled. Louvi's photograph, on the other hand, is quite an accurate reproduction. We do not know exactly how these images were displayed in the museum galleries, as unfortunately no installation viewers remain. But a document in Max Rose's archive reveals that most of the photographs were hung on the wall, whereas the majority of the engravings were shown in display cases, and that the photographs were provided with uniform blue-gray passepartout frames and captions in both French and Dutch, as you can see throughout uh, the presentation. The Rubens collection remained on display until 1919, when it was moved to the depots, as by then the curators believed that it was more reasonable to give priority to works of art over reproductions, given the lack of exhibition space in the museum. On the occasion of the 350th anniversary of Rubens Bird in 1927, the collection was retrieved from the depots one last time and shown in the Antwerp Royal Academy of Fine Arts. However, when the reproductions returned to the museum, their classification was confused, and many of the photographic prints were damaged or taken out of their passepartouts. This carelessness with which the Rubens collection was handled is an instance of a shift in the attitude towards mechanical reproduction that had taken place during the interwar period. From 1936 onwards, the city and the museum disagreed on the ownership of the collection. While the city had su subsidized the project from preliminary research to finalization, the museum had exhibited uh, and conserved the collection since, eight, since 1890. In the bitter negotiations between the two parties, the first cracks in the integrity of the collection appear. In a letter to the Minister of Public Education, the museum's head conservator, Arthur Henri Cornet, defended the place of the collection in his museum by stating, quote, the Rubens iconography does not belong in the print cabinet that covers the general history of engraving, but in the museum of Rubens' works. Moreover, it is difficult to imagine that the city intends to exhibit an iconography of which more than half are photographs of a purely documentary nature in a collection of engravings, end quote. As Cornette's opinion reveals, the graphic and photographic images constituting the Rubens collection started acquiring a different status. Whereas the engravings could be seen as originals in a general history of engraving, the photographs came to be considered as purely representational documentation, perhaps of the state of the painting at the time they were photographed, which could be useful to future restoration. Moreover, the museum conservator no longer spoke of Rubens' oeuvre as constructed through reproductions, both graphic and photographic, but of a Rubens' iconography. This change in the perception of the relation between graphic and photographic reproductions is discussed in William Ivan's print and visual communication. The subjective, quote, engraved representation of a painting was confined to generalized abstract reports about iconography and composition, end quote. Whereas photography allowed for impersonal statements that, quote, reached down into the personality of the artist who made the objects that were reproduced, end quote. Although this view did not originate in the interwar period, which the reflections of Thore Berger had shown, such a notion was not commonly shared in the mid-19th century, when photographs were not yet a truly mass medium, and its technology was far from reliable for the reproduction of oil paintings in all its richness of color hues, so that retouching by hand was often needed. The contract Louis signed uh, for the photo campaign of the Imperial Picture Gallery is a remarkable exception in this sense. Paragraph 10 explicitly states that an unretouched photograph had to be delivered to the museum. In addition, each reproduction had to be checked with the museum management before sale. 
As Sabine Pinot points out in the catalogue Farbe in Schwarzweiß, the museum, and in particular the director of the Imperial Collections, Edouard Ritte von Engert, clearly had scientific objectives in mind with his campaign. To the museum, the photographs had a documentary value, as Harry Cornet, the conservator of the museum in Antwerp, had stated, and could be used to evaluate the state of a painting uh, at this particular moment in time. The Rubens Committee had a different objective, the public display of an oeuvre, that is, of the relation between images. Still, it is worth focusing on the individual images in this collection and analyze what they show us and especially what they fail to show. Although Levy was contractually restricted from making retouchings, the list of recordings of the Imperial Picture Gallery shows that Levy eventually did make some retouchings. As Italian photographer Carlo Naya explained in a letter to Roses in 1880, quote, we must always do this to photographs of old paintings and without retouchings, they are not presentable, end quote. Mariano Morelli was one of the first photogra photographers hired by the committee. He produced some of Rubens' oil sketches in the National Gallery and Dulwich College in London and reported that, quote, the paintings by Rubens, like those by Titian, do not lend themselves to photography at all, end quote. If we compare his photographs after some oil sketches in Dulwich College with Louis' photographs taken eight years later, the latter are of a remarkable quality, comparable with, reproduction, with the reproduction photography of Braun, which um, was at that time the most renowned international player on the market and also the most represented photographer in the Rubens Oeuvre collection. The Louis could reach this level of quality uh, was certainly due to the circumstances of the collection's move to a new building, allowing him to photograph the paintings outside and in an outside photographic turntable studio, and also out of their frames. It also helped that this campaign was initiated by the museum itself. As this quote from the letter by Morelli suggests, photographers uh, that were commissioned by the Rubens Committee did not always have the permission of the institution to take the pictures outside. Sabine Pinot and Hannah Schneck have shown that Louvi did not only have the permission to work outside, he even had a fully operational dark room on site at his disposal, which can be seen in this technical drawing. Here he could prepare the glass plates and experiment with the orthochromatic emulsion to approach the color hues of each individual painting as closely as possible. The translation of colors of oil paintings in monochrome photography remained one of the biggest challenges for, photo for photographers in the late 19th century. As this picture by Jean Laurent reveals, warm tones, such as yellows and reds, appear too dark in conventional photography, whereas blues often appeared as white. A document from 1875 of the British Museum in Rose's archive with conditions for photographers bring to mind the practicalities with which photographers at the time had to work and that are unimaginable with current safety measures including the use of combustible chemicals and gauze lightning inside the museum galleries. This resulted in overexposed or underexposed photographs, in which the yellow varnish either reflected the light or created a blur. Unintended shadows, moreover, obscured parts of the image and revealed uh, the remediation that had taken place. The photographic image itself was, of course, also vulnerable for damage, deterioration, or fading. To prevent this, the committee negotiated with the photographers on the technology that was used. Many letters testify of the preferred épreuve charbon, carbon print, or pigmentdrucker, to guarantee the best resistance to fading. Seeing these images, it becomes clear that photography was at times less successful in reproduction of art than engraving. It explains why the Rubens Committee stated in their provisional report in 1879 that it would be impossible to count on having all the paintings photographed. 
Louis's professional approach does not only indicate the aspirations of the Viennese Museum, it also reveals how much the industry had developed in the 10 years between the start of the committee's collection and Louis's photo campaign. The high variety in quality between the photographs in the collection not only show the experience and skills of the different photographers, but also effectively represents the photographic impulse that took place during the 1880s. This expanding availability and improving quality of mechanical reproductions gradually redirected the attention from the merits of visual comparison between works back to the singularity of the masterpiece. The art historical narrative of the image had largely been replaced by the narrative of the picture and the history materialized on and behind its surface. Whereas engravings represented Rubens' iconography, photography could capture the expressiveness of his brushwork, but also the damages and the cacoli. On the, uh, on the painted... Mm, on the painted surface. <laughs> A photograph of the Rubens uh, Venus in the mirror by Mitke and Waura, uh, on the other hand, showed that the camera also regularly obscured the painterly effect of the original, revealing striking photographic qualities in Rubens' works. Another reason why the oeuvre uh, display lost its urgency in 1919 might have been that the art book had successfully taken over its function. Accessible old master series such as Klassiker der Kunst made Rubens' oeuvre available for both art historian and amateur. Adolf Rosenberg's first edition of his 1905 Rubens monograph contained 551 photomechanical prints. Although these images were of questionable quality, especially in comparison to the heliogravures in more luxurious monographs and reproduction albums, their assemblage in a plate section made these volumes a great tool for visual comparison and allowed to make annotations directly on the image. This was unthinkable in 1877, despite the fact that Rose's active participation in the committee provided him with a rich source of photographic reproductions. His oeuvre catalogue on Rubens, um, published by Josef Maas between 1886 and 1892, only contained one color type directly from an oil painting. All the other illustrations are mechanical reproductions of original drawings or engravings, even though Roses signaled how much the latter often de deviated from the original invention. Besides the technical challenges of color type reproductions that explain, um, that explain the choice for the linear black and white images of modest dimensions, the use of engravings was likely motivated by financial considerations and the byproduct of copyright legislations. If the representation of Rubens' oeuvre is indeed an illustration of the possibilities of the photo photographic medium, it is equally exemplary of the 19th century reliance on graphic reproduction for its accomplishment. Even if the panoramic ambitions of the Rubens Committee are still present in today's art historical discourse, the ongoing catalog project of the Corpus Rubinianum Ludwig Burkhardt is here exemplary. Photographic reproductions are rarely considered worthy of display in a museum setting, unless the display is about photography. An exception is the traveling photo exhibition on Rubens' works in Antwerp collections from 1977. Like the exhibition 100 years earlier, it, it used state-of-the-art photographic technology. The exhibition existed of full-color reproductions developed by Achva Hivert, and if the size of the paintings did not allow for a one-on-one -on -one reproduction, a full-size detail was taken and compared to a complete reproduction in reduced size. Mounted on large panels, the exhibition was adaptable to different settings and was dispersed to Belgian companies, cultural centers, and smaller museums abroad. This brings me to some conclusions. The history of the Rubens Committee's collection uh, reveals many similarities with Louis's photo campaign of the Habsburg collection of paintings. Both projects are symptomatic of the perception of art and notions of how art should be experienced, changing under the influence of rapidly evolving reproduction technologies. 
I started with tracing back the origin of the art historical notion of oeuvre and defining reproducibility as the concept's constitutive model. In that sense, the oeuvre project did not stand alone. Prince Albert's collection of reproductions of Raphael's work, for example, can be seen as an important precedent that had been finalized just one year before Roland Jacquemin put forward his proposal. The Rubens collection was, however, exceptional in its accessibility. Where the, Rub where the Raphael collection conserved in, the Windsor, in Windsor print room was created for a single person, uh, Prince Albert, and visited only by royal invitation. The Rubens collection was assembled to be exhibited and to develop the public taste. The scientific study of Rubens and of art in general in Belgium and abroad developed in parallel with the technological innovation of photography that was in turn driven by the commercial prospect of an emergent mass audience in the second half of the 19th century. Popular events such as the Rubens Year 1877 and 1927 or the Antwerp World Fair in 1885 provided the context to shape Rubens' oeuvre as a visual discourse. By the interwar period, the collection had completely lost its function as a patriotic prestige product, project, and the discussions about its future indicate that an educational function was no longer assigned to its images. In 1950, the question of ownership and conservation of the collection had still not been resolved. The Antwerp Museum conservator at the time, Walter van Beeselaar, therefore suggested that the collection be separated. The photographs would remain in the museum's archives, while the engravings, a much more valuable asset, could go to Rubens' house. Although it was not until 1970 that this plan was executed, Van Beeselaar's proposal is revealing of the changed attitude towards the collection, which was now divided into erratic graphic prints and truthful photographic representations the first gaining autonomous artistic value, the latter being of documentary use to museum specialists. This is now changing again, as early photographs are approached from the same viewpoints of authenticity and craftsmanship that once valorized graphic reproductions as pictures rather than their faithfulness to the original. This shows how much our perception of artistic productions remain determined by the, distinct, uh, by the distinction and interaction between what we refer to as copy and what we consider original. Thank you so much. <laughs>